Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramph. I'm here to usher you in into the weekend. Uh, last week, we didn't do a uh, we didn't do our morning show, but we did do our uh, spring flicks, which was our summer camp. Uh, I mean, geez. I'm all over the place right now. I'm thinking about so many different things because I'm trying to promote our summer camps, which are coming out in July and August of this year. And we have a movie making camp, which are full. Um, we have animation camp. We have documentary camp, which we're going to be taking a couple field trips. It's great for kids who are a little bit more outdoorsy. And then finally, we're going to have our horror camp, which we're going to be geared towards more of a 14 plus, not to mention some kids who have done our camps in the past who have a prereq for our horror camp as well. So. We're gonna jump right in. Uh, we came back from the spring break alive and with plenty of laughs from our, our spring break camp, Spring Flicks, the kids-centric movie making camp geared towards making short films. We'll have a couple of those for you for the uh, for the time being. For there's gonna be each of my shows, I'm gonna highlight a couple of their uh, movies and shorts that they have done. Uh, it's it's quite a it's quite a ride. So, uh, but also I have some bad news in, in terms of the, our, our city council. We had some audio issues from our Monday night city council, but I'll be able to show you some clips from our. Wednesday committee meetings, and also some clips uh, from Wednesdays with the mayor. Uh, this is gonna be a fairly abridged version of my city council meeting, but I'm gonna basically just be a talking head uh, to giving you the highlights of all the things that happened during the city council meetings uh, in terms of just like some of the policies, some of the things, and just basically explaining kind of what happened there. So uh, let's see here, um, let's see. Missoula will be getting Narcon vending machines uh, to help uh, combat overdose in our community. Uh, Susan Hayde Patricks from United Way of Missoula was spearheading this campaign to try to get these uh, nasal sprays and part of these nasal sprays is an important part of basically mitigating overdoses, uh, mostly overdose deaths uh, related to overdoses. And the big thing, the big takeaway from this particular thing is that the fact that they're going to be putting up these vending machines, if there's ever an overdose, you'll be able to have this Narcon, which is a uh, uh, kind of like a uh, drug blockage. And so it deals with people who are going through an overdose and it helps mitigate that stuff, even though they do recommend that you always, if someone does suffer from an overdose, you do call 911 because this isn't one of those things that basically stops. Uh, it's like no, nothing is 100% and nothing is 0%. And so they always ask that you uh, do call 911 if you do experience an overdose, even if the person had the nasal spray and they seem fine after the fact. So the city is also looking to finalize funding from a state bill 355 to put 25% funds to get a matching 75% funds with a uh, match worth of four, uh, $3.4 million value. And so they're putting money aside for this one. There have been a lot of rezoning, a lot of new state laws that are being implemented. Uh, this process culminated in two projects rising to the top in the form of uh, city council's priority list. The Angen uh, Building Rehabilitation, AKA the old post office building, which is gonna be hosting both the uh, city and county in a uh, kind of a, an, uh, an interesting kind of easement. So they created a whole new district in which both the city and county contribute to this uh, site and right now they are getting some uh, 1.2 million dollars of brownfield grants and these grants are mostly related to cleanups asbestos metals coppers all sorts of kind of things that could lead to uh, you know uh, those like old building practices that had things like mesothelioma all that kind of stuff that you have to worry about in terms of that so they're rehabilitating this building using that money um, and so it doesn't hurt that it's uh, the old federal building, which is really good for a lot of grant possibilities in the future, not just this Brownfield grant as well, because there's a whole bunch of new infrastructure grants that have been being passed in Missoula. Missoula is basically taking advantage of over $100 million worth of grants in general, just for infrastructure projects. And this is just one of those uh, projects they want to dip into with their $3.4 million value. Uh, so. Animal co and they didn't talk too much about this one, but their next priority is animal control shelter expansion. More people, more pets, uh, more pet evictions when moving to other places. I always remember that uh, when I was in college, there's a lot of college kids who like the idea of having pets, but they didn't. But they didn't realize that when they moved into a new place, that they were greatly um, disappointed at the, by the fact that they weren't able to find a place that would have a pet. So that was one of the things that was the big deal that was happening and then they would have to give up their pet for adoption, give it to a friend, that kind of stuff. Or in the end, it would have to go to a shelter. So there was a lot of that going on, when, especially when I was in college and Missoula has grown quite a bit for sure. So, and also, 
Uh, I mean, pretty much most of this meeting was just kind of like highlighting the things uh, that the state legislature is working on. And one of those would be to uh, have daycares that used to have a minimum of about a 12 to 15 range. Uh, now it is going to put the minimum at 16 kids on that. And, you know, I didn't know about this, but also breweries can now sell products from other beer vendors. Uh, and one of the big things that I also noticed as well is that the state of Montana is uh, easing the brakes when it comes to uh, regulating uh overnight shelters in places of worship. And so uh, there was a lot of uh, tension going on in part of the eastern uh, cities in Montana from Bozeman, Billings, where a lot of those uh, health officials came forward to be like, hey, you guys can't do this. It's not a safe and sanitary place for people to stay overnight. And some of these restrictions kind of like kind of got lifted. And so for folks who are homeless, this ability to uh, kind of act as a religious sanctuary kind of place has kind of been the thing and if you even look back in history a lot of times uh, places of worships were kind of like the place where a lot of homeless people would go to to you know have a place to stay overnight uh, in, the, in that era as well so there are a lot of provisions for mobile ho home expansion and so uh, essentially you don't have to have like a limit you don't have to uh, one of the big things in, when starting a mobile village or manufactured homes, anything like that, doesn't have to just be uh, houses on wheels. Uh, they do require uh, at least 10 acres to start a mobile home village, but that is no longer the case because if you have a fairly big lot of land, you just need to have mobile homes 20 feet apart from one another on all sides, and essentially you can start your own mobile park, and that's part of the, um, for, that's what the state has done in legislature to help, you know, deal with you know um, shoehorned in affordability and what i mean by that is like mobile homes manufactured homes those kind of uh, facilities were kind of like the old school way of of dealing with affordable homes then we would create teds which was a tax uh tax uh no wait wait um I'm, I'm sorry, I'm thinking off the top of my head right now and I'll not refer to my notes because I'm really trying to stretch this a lot longer than some of the quotes I give you. Uh, but the whole kind of wrap up is that the city want, went into details on all those items, which uh, things being removed and put in for better clarity and less restrictions in some cases in regards to dwellings, uh, starting bakeries, cafes, other small commercial uh, zoning in nature for some of the residents. Uh, one of the things that they definitely noticed in Missoula is that you know, there's a separation of amenities, and that was the old uh, suburban way of doing things, the nuclear families, all that kind of stuff, when we had a uh, rich abundance of oil and we could just travel from across town, get away from the hustle and bustle of city life and all that kind of stuff. And Missoula was definitely one of those things that kind of mixed use and that kind of stuff. Uh, and one of the things that they're trying to do is trying to open commercial possibilities for small businesses to kind of pop up in your neighborhoods. Very much just like, you know, one example, drum coffee next to their school, you know, just kind of going off the top of my head. But, you know, it basically means you it, you apply and if you meet the standards, you're pretty much good to go. Um, and kind of going back into even the uh, sanctuary for places of worship and religious assembly uh, for overnight stays, they do uh, have restrictions for the uh, public safety and health of the community. So Missoula uh, City County Health Department will have to vet and make sure that just because you have people staying overnight doesn't mean it, it is sanitary and so they have to make sure that they live up to those standards. So speaking of public safety and health, uh, they spoke about expanding the farmers market zone to allow for more vendors during the season. But this is a big move because they're moving back into the original location of the Clark Fork River Market. So the Clark Fork River Market Director Kaylee uh, Nazari, Nazari talks a little bit more about uh, their move back. So the reason why I'm here today and bothering you guys is because I am looking to expand the market back to its original location. So during the time that the Transformer was built um, in that lot adjacent to Karis Park, kind of on the Bless Reed side, um, we were able to momentarily move to the Karis Park side um, in front of the carousel. Um, now that that work is done, um, and we're very excited about that, the bridge being complete as well, um, we are looking to move back. Um, for a variety of reasons, number one is better disability access. Um, the other park um, area that we were using did not really allow a good drop-off place for people that were disabled. Um, as you guys know, there were a lot of 
higher um, sidewalks and lower sidewalks that people were working off of, um, which unfortunately allowed us not to be able to serve people with the same ease that were disabled. Um, this space will also allow us to accommodate more vendors. It will allow us to have better access to trash to ensure that nothing is getting on the riverfront that we were just talking about. Um, it also is going to allow us to have a compost program this season, um, compost with ease and push our sustainability mission. All right, so as we look here, you can kind of see this is where Patty Street is. This is the turnoff into the bank, which they also have a little parking lot in the brown areas. Um, the little roundabout off Patty Street, you have the uh, Holiday Inn Express right here. Um, uh, generally, this is just where the actual Clark Fork River Market was pandemic happened, then essentially we had um, uh, Northwest Energy being like, hey, we have to build a transformer. Uh, uh, and then there was not much going on just because they're just like, oh, we have certain restrictions, all that kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. It's like, can we just build a transformer there? They finally did it. Then they did a couple seasons by the carousel uh, uh, in the other parking lot on the other side. And you know, the only access you can get there is roughly the uh, Ryman Street in which the incline was much like this. But when we go to Patty Street, it's a little bit more longer and a little bit more better river access in general for a lot of folks trying to get down there. Um, so that was one of the things that they wanted to uh, talk a little bit more about, you know, uh, just the crossing, ADF accessibility. Uh, the end of the meeting, they spoke. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, actually uh, there's not really much to say. I mean, they just want to move back. They're going to get moved back. And from 5 a.m. to uh, roughly about 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that whole entire uh, parking lot is going to be closed for people parking uh, on every Saturday starting uh, May 5th. Um, oh, wait, what, is it? what was it again? Uh, I always have to double check. I think it's May 4th. Sorry. I just, I always forget about, I always forget about double checking my dates, but it's usually the first Saturday in May, and it's going to be on May 4th, in which the Clark Fork River Market, not to mention the People's Market, which moved over on the other side of Pine Street. And finally, we have the OG Farmer's Market, which is up by the Red X's at the end of Higgins Avenue, as I gesture towards the actual direction, even though you probably don't know which way I'm looking. Uh, in the end of this meeting, they also spoke about items that are going to be auctioned off from the city. Uh, this is from the uh, maintenance guy for the city, Eric uh, Petroff. He spoke about the gear that we, they'll be putting up for auction. So, you know, when the city outlives their usefulness, a lot of their stuff, uh, not to mention, you know, they have to constantly maintain a lot of this stuff. You really just kind of think about it like this. Um, they have a lot of trucks that they use for snow plowing, but they only use them for snow plowing. And so roughly, they drive around town. I, I don't doubt that they probably have anywhere between 40 to 60,000 miles on a lot of these trucks that are more than 10 years old, which is pretty good. And they're constantly maintained in house. So there's a lot of options and a lot of great stuff with this. And so without further ado, here is Eric with the maintenance department talking a little bit more about the surplus uh, for fire department equipment. Resolution uh, includes five vehicles from the fire department. Um, we've got 4197, which is a 2001 water tender, which is just a water truck, um, a 2011 Polaris Ranger 6x6, a 2012 Ford F550 uh, Type 3 with a CAFS unit, a 2007 Ford Ranger um, that was unfortunately totaled uh, during an accident, and a 1999 Ford F550 that we are currently using for a shop truck and plow truck. Um, at this time, I'm just liking to declare the surplus. Um, one of the vehicles, um, we're still waiting to hear from ISO on um, the importance of that vehicle for our ISO rating. Um, if it does not improve our ISO rating, we will probably move on from that water tender. Um, it was purchased you know, over 20 years ago um, to assist us with water supply issues in certain areas of the city that have such been remedied. Um, so the need for that is dwindling and as we continue to grow and be more efficient, um, we need the space, so. All right, so yeah, there's always a lot of maintenance vehicles, a lot of different kind of things that they're uh, like mitigating and downsizing, all that kind of stuff. It's nothing ever new, but it's always something that re definitely bears uh, repeating just because, you know, I mentioned this because at one point, uh, one of the breweries in town were able to convert an old ambulance into a keg mobile. You've probably seen in many of the brew fests at Karis Park, most of these will go forward to the city council meeting for Monday 
days for final approval. Uh, Public Works talks about the Reserve Street, one of the most dangerous streets in Montana, according to the Montana Department of Transportation. This grant plans to adopt a Vision Zero po focus to identify uh, Reserve Street as an area of focus for safety improvements due to the high number of crashes on the corridor related to the uh, the rest of the region. The pro uh, proposed uh, project will conduct supplemental planning through the uh, CTSP by expanding data collection and performing additional analysis and complementary planning for the Reserve Street Corridor, including intersections. So intersections are a big thing. You know, Mullen and Reserve is probably one of the worst intersections in town. One of the biggest gripes that I get from it as well is especially when you're turning left onto Mullen Street, because that's wh what I used to do to go home now since I never have to go on Mullen Street. So, ha! Huh. Forget you, Mullen. But anyways, uh, nothing against Mullen Street, but it's just like, just turning left off reserve. Whew, that was a nightmare. And especially when people are going to the gas station, it's like, they, they, just, like they, it feels like they stop and then they just don't turn into the gas station because there's always some big truck that's pulling out of there and just like, I'm gonna not only take up the right side of the road of me turning left onto <laughs> Mullen going to reserve, but I'm also gonna take up the lane that turns into the gas station just because my angle was weird when I was parking in the uh, Mullen part, uh, the, now the town pump, it used to be called the Mullen station. They had a pretty good jingle. But anyways, I, 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 I just thought that was, uh, it's interesting how they're going to hopefully mitigate some of these issues as well, especially since there's two left turn lanes that go on to Mullen Road, and then they just dwindle dwindle down to like single lanes anyway. So it's yeah, it's 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 a rough street. It's it's a, it's definitely rough, and I hope they figure something out for that particular street. But it's also not just only going to cover that intersection, but the expansive area for um, Highway 90 to Brook Street. So it's not just going to cover that. So they're also talking about that Poplar Farm by the wastewater treatment plant that has has been essential to cleaning up the river for high levels of nitrate. Uh, it's science from your poop. The irrigation requires funds to not exceed uh, $110,000 a year. Um, but I don't want to leave you hanging as we uh, go into Wednesdays with the mayor. There were They spoke about the Missoula Redevelopment Agency and how they were able to utilize $20 million since the Urban Renewal District was established in the late 70s, early 80s, and basically turned it around to about $200 million value by the early 2000s. And so there's a lot of things that the Missoula Red Redevelopment Agency did to help fund some of those things. Many people th were cons really concerned about the tax increment financing. They dove a lot deeper into this particular meeting, which a lot of the money that the taxes came from was the urban district. So a lot of downtown businesses, a lot of those high density kind of areas in town. It wasn't your you know, neighborhood that's like, oh, just randomly out there, right there. It's like, oh, my pay tax is paying for this. No, it was actually part of what they also used for the tourism business, uh, business improvement district in which it was just a lot of the downtown businesses funding this to improve tourism for the city of Missoula. And now we have a fairly large population boom as a result. So, however, this meeting took an interesting turn as some citizens are concerned about the homeless cleanups and how much it's costing the city of Missoula just to clean those up. So Kay, an attendee at Wednesday's meeting, spoke about this and the mayor, Andrea Davis, responded. I just read in the Missoulian $138,000 was spent cleaning up homeless camps. I kind of resent that when I'm looking around at these outrageous property taxes and we're scooping up homeless tents that move 10 feet down the road and you turn around and do it again. Where does, where does some of this end and where does this money come from? Yeah, can I answer this question first? Okay, um, so that money is generally out of our general fund, which is our tax dollars. We've also used, we've also used <laughs> grants to do the same kind of work, but there's not a lot of money for that, so we are using general fund dollars. And we, we, it's a health and safety issue. I mean, we can't let garbage pile up. We have to be able to clean this up. I just came from a five hour urban camping working group. Um, it's something that I was very interested in helping the city council develop an updated ordinance as, as it relates to people that are living unsheltered and outside. And um, we are on the third working group. There will be up to five. We have a number of different interested community members there, including folks that are living unhoused, but social uh, service providers, business representatives there to come up with some solutions that help us basically mitigate the challenge that you're talking about.
All right, so that was Andrea Davis uh, in response to this. You know, they're, they're doing a lot of the working groups so far. They're uh, halfway through their working groups, uh, which are meeting every uh, Wednesday from, five, uh, from noon to 5 p.m. in the city council uh, areas, uh, chambers. Um, so, yeah, it's, this is a double-edged sword. You know, as Missoula, it's like if we don't clean it up and then people are going to complain about the trash pile up and everything like that. It's the thing that's not necessarily being said. It's like there's a lot of people who just don't want to see that. They just want them out of here. And it's like, that's not, that's just un, untenable, unreasonable to just essentially just take people and push them away and put them somewhere else. That's, that's just not what it is. It, it's just very interesting to look at the issue. And I wish the uh, mayor was a little more tactful in her response, to be honest and respectful when delivering this bad news because the borderline inhuman treatment of homeless folks uh, uh, get from people living comfortably and see something like this. And their first instinct is to think about their own. Um, self-preservation like I understand like taxes are rough and I get that and cost of living is up wages have only maybe probably gone up by maybe 20 30 percent but housing went up by more than double and frankly rent vacancy is up in the city of Missoula and nobody can afford to rent in Missoula and the average rent in Missoula is twelve hundred dollars like this is this is kind of like staggering just how bad it's gotten and most of the people who have pretty good situation have been grandfathered in like even myself I've been grandfathered in because I got my house back in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2019. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to date myself. Ugh. But, uh, you know, I hate to leave on such a sour note, but these are the things that are on the back of many people's minds when they're working two part-time jobs for roughly about 60 hours a week. Things are different. Things are different in these times, and if you want to attend those public meetings, you know they have the two more work groups for on Wednesday from 12 to 5, uh, which Andrea mentioned in her response. Uh, you know, two more Wednesdays. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you know I do hate to end it on a sour note, but you know that's just something that many people will just have on the back of their minds, and they're just like they're you really can't do anything except for just clean up after people. You can cite people all, the, all you want, but you know, they're just gonna get stuck in this legal limbo of or just like, oh, I have all these um, tickets to me. I mean, I don't have anything. I have no assets. I have no you know, means to pay for it. So why bother paying for it? I'm just gonna collect tickets. Boom, there you go. Then we have this unattendable situation, which you know, who, someone has to pay. That's just the way it is. But you know, uh, yeah, last, okay. So more positivity. We're going to move on. Uh, I did promise at the beginning of this uh, city council uh, report that I was going to show some clips from our Spring Flicks camp. And so without further ado, here is some fun clips from our Spring Flicks camp featuring those kids uh, from our spring break camp. Banana demon. I trusted you. I gave you all the bananas in the world. Banana. Do we will that summon you turn to bananas? That's not nice. Banana. I am a human man, not a banana. Banana. <laughs> banana. I don't know what you mean by that. I have to turn into banana. Banana now. Banana. I'm ready, banana man. 
banana. On TXX, the government-controlled Pigeon Drone Project has taken over and destroyed most of humanity. On the verge of total destruction, one man stood against the machine birds. In retaliation, the birds sent a humanoid drone called the Pigeonator back in time to ensure its own existence. <laughs> to stop that evil pigeon from killing Sarah Connor. I need 32 guns, 90 grenades, and at least one thermonuclear warhead. Well, I can't necessarily sell you all those guns, or I don't even know how we get a nuclear weapon or whatever, but uh, there's like a 30-day wait period. Roll. Man, I'm so glad I'm Sarah Connor, so I'm not in any danger. Look at me! You will die even coming! Who is that guy? Why do you kidnap me? Be quiet, we need to go now. I don't want to explain it. Now that we're in a safe location, what's the expedition? Okay, there's this um, evil birdman that, uh, there's this evil pigeon man that wants to kill you. He, um, in the future, there are these uh, evil pigeons that uh, are trying to kill the whole world because they're evil. And your son, if you don't die, he will save everyone in the world besides the pigeon mans. Wow, you really just told a really emotionally vulnerable pigeon man! Oh no, I thought you died. Heroic sacrifice! Awesome, Elisa. Robo bird. has escaped. We need young filmmakers with attitude. <laughs> Alright, we're back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. Uh, also some games that came out last week as well. There's just, yeah, there's really not much going on in terms of just like movies in general. It's kind of very much like a, a Dune kind of weekend with only one movie coming out. And it's kicking things off with Godzilla Kong, or Godzilla X Kong, or Godzilla Times Kong, colon, The New Empire. Well, Hollow Earth becomes a thing in this franchise that seems to be really doing a heel turn on itself in terms of how they go about giant monster movies hitting each other in the face by simply making a kaiju buddy cop movie featuring uh, an underworld where creatures live and only Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and uh, Kong fresh off of Axine 
Mecha Godzilla a question more than uh, that. So enjoy Godzilla's new uh, breast cancer awareness powers as the pink to defeat the giant orangutan army and their leader who beats Kong, um, probably, but comes back with a robot arm and the power of friendship to win the day. So that's that coming out. But I didn't have any other uh, movies for some reason. It's weird. Like, there, there are some movies coming out, but I didn't really, I was like, eh, whatever. Let's talk about some games that came out. Nintendo launched their second only uh, Peach-centric movie, Princess Peach so Showtime, starring Peach in her first 3D adventure. We welcome a Broadway-themed adventure for a damsel causing distress for a bunch of drama nerds simply by being there. You think royalty would bump up security for an adventure on a remote island? Yeah. Uh, themed solely for putting on the Kabuki theater-type shows with an ice capage to it? No, so get your theater... Uh, or theatre uh, going for this short adventure. And then we have basically uh, uh, a game that just came out. It's called Dragon's Dogma 2, which has been basically just pan, uh, which has basically just been like constantly just hyped up by uh, consistent IGN uh, gaming uh, website, all that kind of stuff. If you enjoyed the first game, but somewhat watched the first, the Netflix show, which went a little hard on the Seven Deadly Sins as a reference, you'd be whisked away to the worlds of knights and monsters as the origin, who, for lack of explaining, will start off with no memory to uh, simulate the noobs playing as two races, man and lion-type beastie folks. I mean, the, the least they can do is have a better range of character selection, but you, you do get to dictate your customization, what a natural beast or human you can, can think of. So enjoy a series of fights with enemies that are stronger than you until you leave them behind to explore every angle of the game, which uh, at this point feels more like chores in a game than actual gaming. Um, and then finally, we have another fun video for you guys uh, featuring... Um, uh, the Mark of Zorro from the 1940s film, uh, where I just redubbed for my own uh, comedic purposes. So without further ado, here is this, and when I come back, we're going to talk about some events. All right, I got to write this new thing into law, but first, fan fiction. So there I was, just chilling out on the beach, and then Iron Man came flying in, asking for my help. He said, well, you know, I need your kind of help. Please help me. You're very effective. Oh, what? It's slightly darker in here? I thought it was nighttime. Huh, that's a lot of smoke for a candle. Huh, anyways. <clears throat> here we go again. So Iron Man, glistening with his armor, came out of his armor and he said, You know, I uh, want you to be part of the team, the Avengers. You think that's okay? And I was like, in the coolest possible way, I said, yes. Yes, I would do it. Yes, Iron Man. Oh, now if only Iron Man was real. That would be so cool. Oh! Who? 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 Oh! Oh, you! Maybe you should spend more time helping the people than writing fan fiction. I don't advocate for violence, but you've gone too far, and it's time for injustice to get justice. Oh, that's a really good line. Could I use it? Oh, oh, oh. Like, I mean, look at you. You're wasting your money on all these uh, mariachi-type costumes. I, I don't look good? Yeah, I mean, you look fine. Well, whatever. Oh, oh, the lady at the store lied to me. I mean, you can easily be swayed by fashion advice from some random lady. I wouldn't be surprised you're not swayed by some outside government. Come on, pay attention. Can you let me change? Oh, you're gonna change, all right. You're going to give all the money back to the people. All the money that you stole from the people, you're going to give it right back. Oh, uh, we don't have any money. What do you mean? You're like taxing all the people, all this money, all this kind of stuff. I'm on good authority to cut you up if you don't tell me what's going on. It's just business interests. Huh. You don't say. Well, what do I want you, you to spread the word. Oh. Here's my mark. You see that right there? Uh -huh. That means Zoro. Yes. I'm, I'm a pretty big deal. Now you're gonna listen to me. All right, black scarf time. Oh no, please, what are you gonna do to me? I, I, I don't know anything. They just paid me to look the other way while all those people just uh, did mining stuff and pay our people less than average. You know, it's normal things. You know, normal business stuff. It's, uh, oh, jeez. Mexico's not for sale. And when you see them coming in the next time, you're gonna tell them right to their face that Zorro sent you 
and he's uh, never going to stop doing the Zoro things. Okay, I'm out of here. Hey guys, we're back. Let's kick things off with some events that are happening in the city of Missoula. Uh, so, Spring Shift Series Solar. Uh, at the Good Place, 129 West Alder Street, Spring Shift Series is Solar Description. Climate Smart Missoula is doing a part one of our Spring Shift Series to get inspired to make your shift to spring towards climate smart housing and community. So that's just, if you're interested in that kind of going green kind of stuff, it kicks off right now. Uh, Champions for Children March meeting. Uh, Mount Jumbo School is doing a clubhouse to take on the a tour, meet the executive director, enjoy some coffee and pastries, and learn more about the transformative work that is happening for Champions for Children's March meeting at the old uh, Mount Jumbo School at uh, 735 Michigan Avenue in Missoula. Uh, Beginning French Lifeline Learning Center, a lot of, of, of MCPF surface, a lot of MCPS surplus buildings are being used for a lot of charter school adult education, adult education alternative learning solutions for folks looking to take advantage of the space. Uh, former school, uh, former Cold Spring Schools also got a massive bump for uh, grant money for a lot of uh, introduction to pre-K schooling. So it's not just a daycare, they're doing a lot more pre-K schooling to help supplement some of the time while people are working as well. So Missoula Food Bank meal distribution every, uh, every day at 10 a.m. Um, uh, they have short days on Fridays until about 1 p.m. It's a great opportunity for people who just wanna get access to cheap and nutritious foods. Uh, Missoula Butterfly House and Insectarium, they have the open hours at 10 a.m. They have their uh, butterfly release every uh, day at 10.30 a.m. Uh, they release new butterflies into their insectarium. Uh, Israel at War, so part of the Molly program, which is also one of those credit-based learning models to go to school without being a full-time student. Uh, this course will examine the underlying causes of the conflict between Israel and Palestine, Israel and the larger Arab world, uh, Israel and Iran, and the role in the United States, Russia, and China uh, with uh, the European Union. And these conflicts will also investigate through the historical approach. Membership, if you're already part member of Molly, M-O-L-L-I, the membership is $40 a year. Uh, this course fee is $70. Uh, Madrid Kai uh, meets uh, synchronicity uh, in person and online and hybrid f on Fridays for six sessions. So they're kicking that off today. Uh, and lunch at the Missoula Senior Center. So this is a lunch service that provided with the Missoula Senior Center. It's a great opportunity for uh, people who just want to get some food. I believe it's like $8 per plate. Uh, they have a great kitchen, everything like that. And one of the best dance floors in Missoula. Lunch service also at the Palvarella Center for folks who are struggling. It's a great way for people to take advantage of many of the service at the Palvarella Center, which works in tandem with many other places, which also includes the Missoula Food Bank. Yarns at Missoula Public Library every uh, Friday at noon. It's a good opportunity for people to just to to st uh, stitch and crochet in the Blackfoot Board Meeting Room on the fourth floor. Lego Club and After School Meals. Uh, Lego Club is partnered up with uh, uh, Missoula Food Bank. The library also often partners with the Missoula food, food Bank during the summer to get lunches for kids 18 and under. Um, and so this is one of their uh, extension items through the Lego Club. At 2.30 p.m., they also do a bunch of those grab-and-go bags uh, occasionally here at the Missoula Public Library. Ask your local library for more information about that. Overprotected is not safe. Why we hurt and what can we do? This is another one of those uh, Molly programs. Uh, pain is a universal experience. It is almost a universal misunderstood, even with the medical profession. This class is to help mitigate your pain, develop coping mechanisms, and, and, and assert the real pains and other kinds but there aren't. The best evidence now supports the conclusion that correcting these misunderstandings about how pain works is fundamental to recovering from pain. They also wanted to mention that this does not supplement uh, a doctor. There will always be a reason why those ads for medicine tell you to explicitly ask your doctor. It, it is also per important for internal learning and not for something that you can learn to teach other people. It's not to be certified on anything. It's to just basically understand uh, pain uh, from a physician but should not be used to help others. That's one of the, the things that they want to uh, disclaim at this particular uh, thing. But it's basically just to understand pain and how it affects you. Everybody p suffers differently because the worst thing that ever happened to you is the worst thing that ever happened to you.
Think about it like that. D&D Guild Club for Adults, Library Online, the Missou uh, public library hosts a D&D for Adults every Saturday, I mean every Friday at 6 p.m. They also do a teen D&D on Friday nights. Um, Travis Yost, multi genre at Imagination Brewing Company. We're getting into some music stuff with Travis Yost. Dynamic Universal Pickleball rating event is at 6 p.m. Uh, at the, uh, what is that place? Uh, the Pickleball Field. Um, oh man, I guess I didn't write it down. My bad. Uh, dynamic, uh, so a poetry workshop with Chris Latre, Natu Montana Natural History Center, is doing some poetry starting at 6 p.m. Lights, camera, action. MCT is putting on a series of shows combining many elements of popular music and plays in this event, both starting at 5 o'clock and another one at 7 p.m. This is very much just like a cabaret show for a lot of the kids. Uh, for history buffs, the Grizzly Bear in Frontier, and frontier history, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, this is the last uh, Friday of each month from 7 to 9 p.m. Missoula Public Library hosts a guest speaker for a lively, entertaining presentation on historical interests. This program will discuss how the Native Americans on the Western Frontier had a special relationship with the Great Bear, a uh, creature that ventured for its many human-like traits. The Grizzly, uh, the Grizzly's early encounters with the Euro-American, especially Lewis and Clark course, did not progress as planned due to the unexpected vitality and veracity of the um, grizzly bear, the California grizzly, played a special role in the state's history, as did James Captain Grizzly Adams. Um, we also now are in the midst of a uh, grim chapter in history of the grizzly bear man's uh, decimation of its iconic species. Hey, you know, like when there's a bigger human population, a lot of the animals are going to suffer from the impact for sure. It is an unfortunate thing. Uh, you know, you can protect the uh, wild animal as much as you can, but we're basically pushing them out of their normal um, residencies. And most of them tend to want to leave humans alone, uh, but they always, there's too much crossing paths and everything like that. And even the uh, city of Missoula also, for Wednesdays with the mayor, talk a little bit more about the, the bear uh, resistant garbage cans because there's no such thing as bear proof. Uh, Josh Farmer is going to be at the Old Post. Uh, he's the piano man. He's going to be playing the Old Post at 7 p.m. Uh, Concura, Communication in Motion. Headwaters Dance Studio is doing con some contemporary dance at 7 p.m. They do a lot of dance performances there as well. This is uh, Concierra. Um, Lamb of God Production. So we're doing an Easter musical at the Church of the Latter-day Saints at 3201 Bancroft Street. If you're interested in doing the Lamb of God production, you can join them at 7 p.m. on tonight. Karaoke at the Jack Saloon. Uh, Christian Wallowing Bowl with Maria Zepeda is going to be at the Zach. Indigenous uh, singer-songwriter Christian Wallow Wallowing Bull resides in Wyoming just outside the Wind River Reservation. With family relations to the Wind River and he enrolled in members of the Northern Aparo tribe, his heart as a storyteller is represent his own indigenous roots and to bridge perspective in healing the lives of those indigenous as well as non-indigenous folks as well through his music. Um, and that's going to be at the Zach tonight at 7.30 p.m. Latin Night with Big Lou is going to play electronic music at 9 p.m. Uh, Cash for Junkers can be featured at Union Club, Saturday Markets and such. Uh, one more uh, month until the May 4th outdoor market kicks off from about 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Orchard Homes, uh, they open up at around 10 a.m. They're just off of Reserve Street. Up 3rd and Southgate it hosts the uh, winter market uh, every Saturday as a supplement until the summer really kicks off. Adult softball pickup play day. So starting at uh, 10 a.m. tomorrow, uh, McCormick Park is doing a baseball. So if you uh, want to do some baseball, it's little bursts of uh, energy now and then. But most of the time, you'll be standing around playing baseball. It's a good opportunity for a lot of folks. 10 a.m. at McCormick Park, uh, hosted by the Parks and Rec. Uh, curious Creatures Spiders. Butterfly House has more than butterflies. And so they're going to be talking about spiders at the Butter Missoula Butterfly House starting at 10 a.m. Story time at the Missoula Public Library. This is a great opportunity for a lot of kids to uh, learn to read and also uh, get engaged with story time here at the public library on the second floor. Making and using molds. Clay City of Missoula is doing uh, about mold making and so this is instead of like making one model and be like that took a lot of work you can essentially make that model and make it over and over and over and over again. It's an expensive uh, for this lesson, but of course it's pretty fun because once you get a mold for your uh, for your uh, sculptures, you can pretty much put anything in it for future use. And you know, it's such a great opportunity for a lot of people as well. Just look at uh, what the uh, Mythbusters did with a lot of their uh, uh, gel 
uh, back in the day. And basic mold making is definitely a really fun thing to do just in general. Uh, step back in time, vintage dress up pop-up sale. This is the old frat house at 1221 Arthur Avenue. Transport yourself to bygone era of the exclusive vintage dress up pop-up sale. They are doing at the old frat house bed and breakfast for a curated collection of 200 timeless pieces spanning fashion trends from 1950s to the early 2000s. From elegant gowns to funky finds to bedazzled jeans with uh, crucifixes on them and um, hopefully they still have the hair gel from Jersey Shore. Uh, MCAT Saturday drop-ins every Saturday at 1 p.m. to about 3 p.m. Kids get to come in, workshop some ideas for stop animation. And then they also have a Saturday kids activities uh, featuring bears at Montana Natural History Center. Um, Indian Country Conversation Land and Culture Museum has a whole gallery section devoted to indigenous art. Uh, Linda Frost, a contemporary American Indian um, artist, uh, this uh, discussion aims to uh, uh, provide a platform for research, innovation, and traditional knowledge by indigenous artists, scholars, researchers, and advocates. Indigenous and non-indigenous speakers are invited to converse in dialogues specific to particular issues and themes addressed in the current exhibitions at the MAM. And this is starting at 1 p.m. on Saturday. Um, annual Easter Farm Market at Turner Farms. Turner Farms is doing a pop-up market with various local vendors. Help Easter Bunny fill those baskets with unique locally made items. Turner Farms will have their farm-raised hams for the Easter feast. So if you're going down the road a little bit further past the Orchard Homes, uh, Turner Farms, you can't miss it. There's, you, there's, there's a bunch of houses with a bunch of, with, uh, connected by uh, basically an interesting kind of mixed-use farm facility. I think it's a pretty cool site that they have there because it's like you have homes, homes, then barns, all sorts of cool things there as well. Um, and then for your Saturday night, Free Cycles is hosting a jam session called Flash Panda Live at Free Cycles. Uh, Brandon Nolan at the DraftWorks uh, doing 7 p.m. rock show. Battle to Beat Cancer, multi-genre at UN, UM Denison Theater at 7 p.m. Dancing with Hearts, Missoula Stars is gonna be featured at the Wilma Theater at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday. The Goth Ball, dress in your best black and eyeliner at the Zach at 8 p.m. Jaden Decker at the Jack Saloon, uh, playing country at 8 p.m. Solid State Karaoke at West Side Lanes and Fun Center. Banging Out Drag Show at Monks at 9 p.m. Ida Ranch Hands is going to be at Union Club. DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at 10 p.m. at the Badlander. Gravy Ladies is going to be featured some rock and reggae music at the Top Hat Lounge, and that'll wrap up your Saturday. And then as we get into your Sunday, Easter brunch at the Barn on Mullen. The Barn on Mullen is 8500 Mullen Road, Missoula. Starts at 9 a.m. This is a big kind of uh, thing. It's 50 bucks, but it is a brunch buffet and bottomless mimosas, drinks, food, carving stations, assorted desserts, all that kind of stuff. Then there's the Easter church service through a church called Explore Church. And immediately following the service, we'll be hosting an Easter egg hunt for the kids starting at 1030 a.m. Deer, resident trees, shrubs, and perennials seminar. Karis Nursery is doing a uh, tree, uh, deer resistant trees and more information about this is educational starting at noon on Sunday at Karis Nursery. Early bird deadline permaculture, permaculture workshops. And so this is part of Missoula and Nine Valley early bird deadline permaculture workshops description all registered by March 31st for this mid April workshops re receive the 10% discount, blah, blah, blah. And so this is basically just learning about permaculture and it starts at 11.30 a.m. in the Missoula Nine mile, mile Workshops and all that kind of stuff. You can learn more information by going to MissoulaEvents.net. MissoulaEvents.net, it is a wonderful website garnered, uh, garnered towards people who want to put the word out on different things that are happening in the city of Missoula. And so if you could take a look right here on the website, you can kind of see all sorts of things happening as well. And there's always new things that pop in and go. Um, I, I, I try to make sure I... Uh, uh, make this happen on Wednesday so I don't get um, uh, blindsided by certain kinds of things because I always notice that especially when they're promoting for the first Friday is that they don't tend to uh, uh, put the first Friday art and description in until later towards the end of the week and so a lot of times people tend to miss it out especially people who like to forward plan for their show so that's pretty much it um, in terms of events that are happening in the city of Missoula. You're more than welcome to go to MissoulaEvents.net to kind of learn what's going on in Missoula. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about news that are happening as well. Uh, Greg Forte was here in Missoula not so long ago on um, Thursday, and he was there to uh, basically open the first Amazon facility in Montana, which created more, more than 100 jobs according to the governor's office. Uh, quote, Montana is stronger when companies like Amazon choose to invest in our people and our state. Republican Governor Greg 
Adrian Forte said in statement, I'm thrilled to welcome this uh, investment that provides Montanans with an opportunity to thrive in good paying jobs, brings faster and more efficient package delivery to residents and strengthen our community partnerships. And just so you know, it is new and I've heard some complaints about some deliveries, but I just wanted to mention is that they've gotten a lot better since they first started. You got a bunch of new employees, you know, a lot of new deliveries, all that kind of stuff. And so essentially this Amazon wages, this facility start at $17 an hour and can go up to $19.40 an hour. So there's a lot of opportunities for people to get a job and yeah, all hail the overlords of Amazon, I guess. But yeah, it's interesting to kind of see this kind of thing as well as uh, there's a lot of other uh, vacuum technology, vacuum investments in Lewistown that will create up to 500 jobs and a man, a man, Ammunition manufacturer Brickstell Defense opening Glendive will create 350 jobs and modular home manufacturer Develvi uh, investment in Butte will create more than 400 jobs. And so there's a lot of news happening in the state of Montana in terms of job creation. Heck, even in the United States, more and more jobs are created every day. And there's just a lot of opportunities for people to uh, get on it, essentially. So we're going to go right back in. And last week, we didn't have city council, but they released an update on our water system progress since our acquisition in 2017. Can you believe it's only been uh, seven years since the city of Missoula acquired their uh, water company? It was a quite a long litigation. And boy, I tell you, it was the very early parts of my time here at MCAT. We were live streaming it. We were putting it online just so uh, people didn't actually have to show up to court for some reason. Lazy. Anyways, the city's mo most recent leak survey showed a total estimated leakage rate of 8,273 gallons per minute, which is a reduction of 16% over the last two years. Uh, as compared to last year, the leakage rate decreased by 390 gallons per minute, saving 560,000 gallons of water per day, enough to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. This leakage reduction will save nearly 205 million gallons of water per year with the added benefit of reducing the city's greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 160 metric tons of CO2 equivalents per year by decreasing the amount of water pumps need to run. So the water pumps take electricity, takes power, and creates energy from CO2. And you know, Northwest Energy uses coal-based plant to do more CO2 and that kind of stuff. And so it ebbs and flows and all that kind of stuff. So if we're able to reduce the amount of uh, pressure we put on the pumps, uh, we, we all win in the end. So this was one of the major points made against former uh, owner Carlisle Group, which was a holding company who was running the show and effectively avoided any bids that the city of Missoula gave, which prompted a suit on grounds of imminent domain, which resulted in the multi-million dollar purchase of the company, which became Missoula City of Water. The 8.7 million miles of water mains have been replaced and they've already seen major reduction in that water loss. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions, Missoula County will use EPA funds to help reduce smoke in Missoula uh, when there are fires that affect the valley. The U.S. Environment Protection Agency Region 8 Administrator oof, visited Missoula to tout the $3.5 million in federal grants that was recently awarded to air quality divisions of the state Montana, Missoula County, and the Confederate Salish Kootenai tribes to fund efforts to better de uh, de detect wildfire smoke, mitigate its effects, and uh, educate Montanans how to stay safe once air quality starts to deteriorate. So, so this is a big deal for a lot of HVAC type businesses. So there's going to be a lot of money going towards this kind of stuff. And so it allows for buildings to be a little bit more effective for clean air ignition. You know, the, we, the uh, library has also had those kind of like um, air quality testers on each floor to make sure that the air flow in the uh, the new building is good not to mention it also clean because you know when it comes to air you can't just close a building off and not have outside air it's air air is everywhere most of the time you can't see it um, uh, but if you, you know, want to test the air quality in a room, you can always get a tester in any hardware store and box store online. So I do suggest if you are interested in learning about your air quality, even in your own house, it's only anywhere between 40 and 60 bucks. Pretty good. You can learn the air quality of your room. It's, it, it's a digital tester and all that kind of stuff. So, oh uh, yeah. And so we're going to kind of, uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, there's kind of interesting news happened out during the NCAA tournament and looks like Quarter Lane, Idaho is back in the news for uh, more racism. The NCAA tournament in Spokane brought the Utah women's team as they went to go to Quarter Lane for their hotel stay. Of course, you know, when you go to a tournament, you go to a city like Spokane, hotels, uh, 
are pretty, uh, uh, you know, hard to come by. And so Utah coach Lynn Roberts said her team experienced a series of hate crimes after arriving at the uh, first NCAA tournament hotel in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The story started out as a drive-by. Uh, they used choice words, inwards, as such. Uh, some of the teams walked from the hotel to a restaurant. Uh, things escalated because after the fact, there was 100 people driving up in cars, revving up their engines, yelling, expressing their free speech. You know, and sometimes free speech isn't something anyone has to hear, especially if it borders around harassment and intimidation which they did all night long. This wasn't the first instance of intimidation as the Pride Queer event in the anti-protest resulted in arrest of many of those folks who were dressed like a militia group. It's on Facebook. You can't not see it. It's, it's crazy just to see how many people who are dressed up in body armor, uh, gear, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, you're... You, you, it's like, and then the, the, the argument's always just like, oh, we're just making sure that keeps the peace. It's like, it's not your job. That's like, like just... It's fine. We're great. Whatever. But anyways, um, in this also kind of we're going to have a little bit of a history lesson before I wrap my show, because one of the many programs on MCAT is uh, um, was the uh, some of the programs that were produced in Idaho about the Ku Klux Klan in the late 80s in northern Idaho. Um, the 2000 in 2012, neo-Nazi groups rehabilitated the former compound in the Hoodoo Mountains in Bonner County, Idaho. Even the benefactor of the Montana vigilantes. Uh, Granville Stewart was pro-slavery guy who left to, from the South to Montana, where he was featured in the book *A Decent and Orderly Lynching*, which told the story of the Stewart Stranglers. Yeah, so this would also go into the conspiracy of Thomas Mars death, who was the uh, regional territorial governor of Montana after his uh, duty within the Union Army when he became territory governor of Montana. They actually hung a man who he wanted to make sure he saw his day in court, but they didn't give him due process, so they hung him, and they actually left a note for Thomas More directly threatening him. The vigilantes would end their reign when they hung an innocent Chinese man when a white guy broke in and murdered his wife, and then they blamed him for it. And here's the kicker. Granfield Stewart's Wikipedia doesn't actually mention his more colorful past, but it did mention his, inter his interest in history at the time, while it still looked like Montana vigilantes with uh, rose-colored glasses. So I suggest you read the book, A Decent Orderly Lynching, since after six years uh, they ended their vigilante in Montana, they ended it with that Chinese man wrongfully being hanged, and the people were called out and told to disband uh, well, long before that, but and they never apologized for that. And basically, one of them was basically uh, quoted in saying, "50 was a nice round number when it come to like all the people that they hung." You know, they started off as like the justice system in Montana was rough. It was the Wild West in true blue source, uh, but it just kind of ended with like, yeah, just the the constant idea of you know, you know, unchecked power. When you have unchecked power, that's just kind of those kind of things that just kind of happens. And it's it's too easy for us to be like, eh, whatever. And this is how people, how far people can take things without being called out for doing the wrong thing, thinking, you know, f thinking about it for the right reasons. Thus, a nice history lesson and, and an, an, a great way to end my show. And I wanted to thank you guys for joining me. And for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramf. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. There's a lot going on. The weather is looking better and better as spring is more sprung than it's ever been in Missoula for last couple for last couple of years for sure because you know it's supposed to be snowing all the time. So thanks guys.